can you hear me? Yes, great. So I just have a quick announcement in, uh, as far as the uh, um, order in which the speakers will be presenting uh, is concerned. So we will start with uh, Heidi and then uh, we will have Lars Nieberg remotely, followed by uh, Christine and then uh, Anders Fjell uh, before the lunch break. I will just say a few words about Heidi because she's also not part of the consortium and it's a great honor to have her heard here today. She's a Wellcome Principal Research Fellow and Director at the Wellcome Center for in Integrative Neuroimaging at the, oh, you are part of the consortium, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, but it's so great to have you. And her, her special area is plasticity and recovery of the sensory motor system with particular influence uh, focus on white matter plasticity and activity dependent myelination. And her group uses a variety of neuroimaging and simulation tools in healthy human volunteers across the lifespan, individuals with brain damage and rodents. And what I like particularly about your work is that you are really trying to get at the mechanistic understanding of human plasticity by making comparisons across all these levels. So it's fantastic to have you here today. Brilliant. So th thanks very much for the introduction, Norman, and thanks for the invitation to join. Um, so it's true, so I was somewhat involved in LifeBrain in the early stages, but then have been much less involved as the project has progressed. So it's been really great to have the opportunity to see all, of, all that the consortium has uh, achieved over the last six years. Um, you know, from the Oxford side, it was very much Klaus and my colleagues, Claire and Nayara uh, and Anya and others who, who took the lead on actually getting on and, and doing the work within the consortium. So it's great to see all of the progress that has been made. Um, I'm going to be, uh, in general, talking about something a little bit different to what we've heard about so far. So as Norman mentioned, my group are interested in understanding basic mechanisms of uh, brain plasticity and using studies across species to try to understand that. So I'll um, give you some examples of, of those types of projects. But to begin with, I was, was just going to plug uh, um, recent data, which has recently come out uh, from the lab, which is in, um, where we've been trying to use imaging to monitor plasticity across the lifespan, uh, this being something of particular relevance uh, to this group. So um, this is um, the results of a, a collaborative study that we did with colleagues in other universities in the UK uh, to look at the effects of a physical activity intervention um, in older adults. Uh, so it's a REACT study. It was um, led by our colleagues in public health departments. So it's very much a a different territory for us rather than a sort of laboratory based intervention study where we bring people in for a strict dose of a physical activity intervention it was much more of a real world community based scalable intervention so the intervention was delivered and designed by our colleagues in public health departments it was done in a very um, scalable way across a large population and what they were interested in was looking at the uh, effects of this physical activity intervention on uh, mobility, that was their primary outcome, uh, was mobility. And what they found, uh, as recently published um, in these two papers here in Lancet Public, Public Health, was that this one-year intervention did indeed um, improve mobility across this group and that it was a cost-effective intervention in terms of the health economic impact of that. And as um, brain and cognitive scientists, I'm uh, hoping you'll be aware that mobility is a really interesting precursor often to cognitive decline. Uh, and dementia. So it was an outcome that we were also very interested in. Um, so what we did in the context of this trial was add cognitive assessments across the whole trial and also conduct an um, imaging sub-study. So this is work from Nayara, uh, who is here today and who you will know well um, as a LifeBrain colleague. Uh, so led by Claire Sexton, another colleague who's now moved to the US. Um, and Nayara and Claire ran an um, MRI sub-study within the context of REACT where 100 of the participants from the larger trial uh, were given brain scans over different time points across the trial. And what we found, uh, encouragingly, was that indeed this um, community-based scalable exercise intervention reduced the atrophy um, of the left hip campus. So you can see the difference here, whereby the, you know, there's a reasonable um, drop in hippocampal volume in the control group, uh, as you might expect among these older cohort over, this is over a one-year time uh, scale, whereas that drop is significantly reduced uh, in the physical activity group. So demonstrating, you know, another example of ways in which we can use imaging to detect uh, effects on the brain through an intervention uh, in the context of brain aging. Interestingly, um, although we measured cognition across a, uh, not only the sub-study uh, in detail, but also in the main study using kind of light touch uh, 
uh, cognitive assessment, there wasn't any evidence for cognitive benefits, despite this uh, clear evidence of um, slowing of hippocampal atrophy. So that raises interesting questions as to, you know, is that because the hippocampal um, volume doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening in terms of cognition, or does it reflect the limitations of the ways in which we've assessed cognition um, in this particular trial? So that was really just to flag that, and please do follow up with Nayara if you're interested uh, in finding out more about that study, which was a really impressive achievement of her PhD when she was here in Oxford. But then what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking to you about is some of the um, other work that we've done in the lab where we're trying to use imaging to understand basic principles of brain plasticity. So the couple of questions that I'm going to address is where does plasticity happening happen and when does it happen? So we've been, we're all familiar with the idea that the uh, synapse is the site of uh, brain plasticity and synaptic plasticity underlies learning and memory in the brain. We understand very well the biological processes of synaptic plasticity and the rules that govern synaptic plasticity. One of the questions we've been interested in is whether there are other sites for adaptive plasticity in the brain, and in particular, whether there are um, structures within the white matter that show uh, adaptive plasticity. And our interest in this area began you know, more than 10 years ago now through this study of a, a PhD student at the time, Jan Schultz, who showed using imaging that when people learned a new skill, in this case, learning to juggle, that changed the structure both of the um, cortex, the gray matter of the cortex, and also underlying white matter microstructure. So what we found was um, increases in volume in medial occipital and parietal areas, areas that are involved in uh, reaching and grasping to the periphery of visual space, so a relevant uh, function for this particular skill. But importantly, also using diffusion imaging, we found changes in white matter fractional anisotropy and underlying uh, white matter pathways, suggesting that you know, the healthy adult human brain white matter uh, structure can be changed through experience and training. So what does this mean? Uh, is, does the white matter show plasticity? And if so, what aspect of white matter structure is changing uh, as a result of that training. And as you'll be all be aware, a challenge with many of our imaging measures is that they're not directly measuring a particular biological component that we might be interested in. They're giving us some surrogate marker, uh, which could be sensitive to all sorts of different types of change. So this is just illustrated here. In the case of fractional anisotropy or FA, when we observe an increase in FA, there's many different underlying cellular scenarios that could give rise to that increase in FA. And just a few of those are illustrated here. So, for example, it could reflect um, increase in packing density of the axons, could reflect reduction in the diameter of the axons, could reflect more coherent organization of the axons, or it could reflect changes in the myelin sheath around the axons. So, for example, formation of new myelin on previously unmyelinated axons or thickening of myelin on previously myelinated axons. And using our diffusion measure alone, we can't differentiate between these different possibilities. Any one of them or any combination of them could give rise to an increase uh, in FA. So um, because of that, then we've, over the last 10 years or so, had a parallel program of research in rodents where we can directly measure and manipulate different aspects of the underlying biology in order to try to understand what is it that's driving these white matter plasticity effects. And I'm not going to talk about any of that uh, in detail today, but just to sort of summarize a number of different studies. So what we've shown then is if you um, uh, study these phenomena in animals where we can directly measure myelin, for example, using histological techniques to look at myelin stain in, in sections of, of brain post-mortem, in addition to our imaging metrics, so we can acquire the very same imaging measures uh, in the rodents, we can show that where we change white matter microstructure with a, a training paradigm, we can see changes in myelin when we measure it directly. We can also um, disrupt processes of myelin plasticity, for example, using transgenic manipulations to directly interfere with steps along the putative myelin plasticity pathway and show that when we interfere with myelin plasticity, we impair the animal's ability to learn new skills. So taken all together, data from our lab and many other labs um, now as well suggests that uh, myelin plasticity may play a role uh, in learning. 
such that active axons are more heavily myelinated. And that's been shown, for example, very elegantly uh, in various studies with zebrafish, where if you're familiar with the um, zebrafish model, a nice thing about these little transparent fish is that you can image them and see individual axons in a living, behaving fish. And so what they can show using that kind of model system is that you get preferential myelination at the level of individual axons, preferential myelination of active axons. Uh, and there's many different studies now which have teased apart the precise pathway, signaling pathways involved in that apparent activity-dependent myelin plasticity. So it's a thing, it's a phenomenon. We can see it um, indirectly using imaging methods in our human studies. We can see it and manipulate it more uh, directly um, in animals. And there seems to be this relationship between learning um, and myelin plasticity. But there's many, many questions also raised um, about the nature of this phenomenon. So, uh, you know, it, so we know active axons are preferentially myelinated, but there's many reasons that could explain that. It could simply be to do with um, supporting the increased energy demand of activity, not necessarily learning. So one way in which we could start to address that is to try to understand what are the rules that govern myelin plasticity. And I mentioned earlier that we all know a lot about synaptic plasticity. So we understand the rules that govern synaptic plasticity that make it a mechanism that's well suited for learning and memory. And one of the rules that governs synaptic plasticity is sort of Hebb's rule. So cells that fire together, wire together, we can summarize Hebb's rule as. So what that means is that synaptic plasticity is spike timing dependent. It's not just a readout of activity, it's uh, synaptic plasticity cares about the timing or the patterning of activity. It relies on coincidence detection mechanisms. So you selectively prime uh, synapses where you're getting coincident activity. So one question we had is, does myelin plasticity follow similar rules? Does myelin plasticity care about the patterning of the activity along the axons that are being myelinated? And this is work from the PhD of Alberto Lazari, which just came out this week uh, in Cell Report. So you can see that paper. Uh, for more details, but um, in summary, what we did in this study, so this was a study in humans in this case. So we first of all had to have a way of inducing plasticity along a particular pathway, and we did that using a technique called a paired associative transcranial magnetic stimulation or paired associative TMS, uh, which for those of you who aren't familiar, you have uh, TMS coils which are used to non-invasively stimulate the cortex using rapidly changing magnetic fields. They're placed on the skull. Uh, and you apply a pulse um, which induces activity in the underlying cortex. There's a well-established protocol, which is illustrated here, where you have two TMS coils over two interconnected brain areas. In this case, the premotor of one hemisphere and the primary motor cortex of the other hemisphere. And you apply, apply pairs of pulses in quick succession. And if those pairs of pulses are delivered in a so-called Hebbian protocol, where they're close together, we know from previous studies that strengthens that pathway. It strengthens the physiological connection between those two areas. Whereas if you put the same two pulses in, uh, in a non-Hebbian protocol, so separated in time, it doesn't physiologically strengthen the pathway. So here we can control between the amount of activity going into the system, the number of pulses, and the patterning of that, that activity to ask, does, it, does the brain care if this activity is Hebbian or non-Hebbian? So we can look first of all at um, the degree to which this plasticity induction protocol induces long lasting functional plasticity. So here we're using TMS to probe the excitability of the motor cortex before and after the plasticity induction protocol. And we can show that, uh, then we can look at the change in excitability as a result of the plasticity induction protocol. So as I mentioned, it's been previously shown that this protocol induces plas rapid plasticity, we looked for the first time if that lasts for 24 hours. So if we look 24 hours later, do we find that the system is, uh, continues to be um, plastic? And indeed it does. So if we look at our probe of plasticity using TMS, we can see that our Hebbian protocol in green uh, changes the excitability of the system, and that's still there 24 hours later. Whereas the non-Hebbian protocol, as we would expect, doesn't change the um, excitability of the system. So this plasticity induction protocol, specifically the Hebbian form, uh, induces functional plasticity in the system. The question is, does any associated myelin change also care 
about whether the activity is uh, Hebbian or not. So to address that question, we used um, MT imaging to uh, map myelin across the whole brain before and after the plasticity induction. So then we can compare those brain scans to look at the change in myelin. And what we found was that the functional plasticity correlates with the myelin plasticity in the stimulated pathways, but only with the Hebbian stimulation. So if we unpack that complicated interaction, what that reflects is that with the green Hebbian protocol, the greater the physiological plasticity, the greater the myelin change, whereas that relationship is not present with the non-Hebbian protocol. So it suggests that uh, myelin plasticity does indeed follow these Hebbian rules. The myelin change cares about the patterning of the activity, which is important because for it to be adaptive, for the plasticity to be a learning mechanism, it really needs to care about the patterning of the activity. Okay, and then another example that I wanted just to talk you through is uh, questions that we've asked about when does plasticity happen, happen? So how rapidly can we see changes? So we were talking earlier in the context of aging and development, you know, should we be looking at one year, two years, five years, time periods to see changes in the brain over a lifespan um, relevant time scale? We've been interested in looking at sort of very rapid changes in the brain uh, and how quickly we can shift either brain structure or function um, through altering experience. So uh, as you saw from the study that I just showed you, we can see relevant changes in um, myelin, for example, over a 24 hour period. Uh, and in the next example, I want to talk to you about, um, we looked at rapid changes in functional maps in this case. And so here, the question that we had was, can we rapidly remap functional maps uh, of the body? And this was work from James Kolosinski, a former um, student in the lab, uh, that he did during his PhD. Uh, and so the, the readout of functional plasticity for this study was these individual digit maps that you can derive very nicely, in this case, using a seven Tesla fMRI uh, to derive these individual maps of the digits. And we used this uh, approach to ask, how can we um, shift these maps as a result of altered experience? So we looked, for example, in the absence of altered experience, these maps are very stable over time. They're very stable over time within an individual. So we wanted to see if we could shift them by changing people's experience. And we did that by gluing two of the fingers together for 24 hours. So people in these experiments came in for multiple different brain scans. And between two of the scans, we glued their first and second fingers together using a special surgical glue that you could remove the next day. So the question is, can we shift these maps by gluing two of your fingers together for 24 hours? Uh, and it turns out that we can. So the way that we're quantifying the shift in the maps is to um, characterize the degree of overlap between the maps for individual digits. So sort of schematically, you can see the, the four separate digits shown here. We're quantifying the degree of overlap between pairs of digits. And what we found was these rapid remapping of the digit maps after just 24 hours of gluing two of your fingers together. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the degree of overlap between pairs of digits for various control conditions, and then the scan that's taken after the 24 hours of gluing. And what we find, interestingly, is uh, that the degree of overlap between the two fingers that were glued together doesn't change in the cyan, but what we see is less overlap uh, between the adjacent two fingers and more overlap between the two fingers that weren't glued together, between four and five. So when you glue together these two fingers, perhaps what you end up doing is changing the way you use the other unglued fingers such that um, these two work closer together and these two work uh, less together. So this was an interesting and intriguing result, which led us to make a, a new prediction about how behavior might change. So if that's how the brain is remapping, what would we predict should happen to behavior? And what we would predict is that if you're um, shifting the brain maps in this way, then you might expect that the uh, digit pairs which show increased cortical overlap, so four and five in this case, people should get worse at differentiating tactile inputs to those digits because you've got more overlap, more confusion between those inputs. Whereas for the digit pair three and four, where the cortical maps have moved further apart, you should get better at differentiating those digits because there's more differentiation in the inputs. So we tested that in a new experiment um, with new people where we tested behavior using 
called a temporal order judgment task where you deliver pairs of tactile stimuli to fingers and they have to tell you which one was stimulated first. And we found that the behavior change did fit the prediction from the neural change. So here what's being plotted now is how good they are at differentiating the digits. Again, you can see no change for the control condition. The change is all happening after the gluing condition and it's happening in the predicted direction. So for the digit pair that where we see less overlap in the cortical maps, subjects get better at discriminating the inputs. Whereas where we saw more overlap in the cortical maps, they got worse at discriminating the inputs. So that suggests that even very short term change, so just 24 hours of gluing your fingers together, uh, alters your cortical functional brain maps in a way that's uh, behaviorally relevant. Um, which is interesting that you've got this sort of very rapid plasticity going on in the brain. But in spite of that, remarkably, we've um, shown in data that I'll show you in a moment, that the basic topography of those cortical digit maps, their layout and um, relationship to each other is remarkably resilient to altered experience. And we've shown this in the context of amputees. So my colleague Tamar Makin, who was formerly um, a fellow in the lab and is now um, has now just moved to Cambridge actually as a professor there. She uh, came to the lab to study how um, limb amputation impacted on um, cortical reorganization. And so as I'm sure you're aware, people who have a limb amputated often experience a vivid, vivid phantom limb. So although their limb, their hand, for example, is no longer there, they perceive the hand, they can voluntarily move the hand, they can feel the hand. Sometimes there's um, uh, extreme pain from the hand, uh, but here we're just focusing on the representation of that phantom hand. And it turns out if you put um, people post limb amputation in the fMRI scanner and you ask them to move their phantom hand, which is absent, you see just as much brain activity in the sensory motor cortex as you would if I were to move my uh, intact hand. So the, there's preserved representation of the phantom hand in people post um, limb amputation. So a question that we had then is, well, okay, there's activity there, but how organized is that activity? For someone who might have lost their limb decades beforehand, so they've not had the actual limb present for 20, 30, 40 years, to what extent is the topography of the digit still preserved despite the fact that the digits are absent? So we looked at this with Sana Kigat, who was a PhD student with uh, myself and uh, Tamar, using that same protocol of looking at individual digit maps uh, using the 7T scanner. So here you're seeing data from two controls, so similar representation to previously, except now there are five digits represented where you see that same topography moving up the central sulcus. And what we found remarkably in case studies of um, uh, amputees with phantom limb who reported being able to voluntarily move the digits of their phantom missing hand was that the representation of the phantom digits were just as organized topographically as they were in healthy controls. And we have various ways of looking at that quantitatively in the paper. So that raises all sorts of interesting questions as to what drives you, know, what, how do we make sense of that? So we can rapidly shift these maps with altered experience by gluing your fingers together. Yet if you're missing the hand altogether for decades, that basic topography remains um, hardwired into the brain. So in conclusion, then um, imaging can detect adaptive brain plasticity through the lifespan, as, as we know from many studies from people in this room. And we're also interested in trying to uh, use imaging alongside other types of approaches to really understand the basic mechanisms of brain plasticity and where, how and when uh, plasticity occurs. Thanks very much. There was a discussion at the end, but if there is uh, an urgent question, then you want to ask right now, we can do this too. Otherwise, we. I see two hands raised. There are two you hands? See, uh, okay, whoever raised his hand or her hand in the hybrid sphere, please speak up. Uh, oh, whoever they... raised his hand, no? Clap, sorry. Never claps. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then I think we just go on with the next talk. Thanks again. It was extremely interesting.